everyone to uh, our webinar tonight for Romania Without Orphans Alliance. And um, uh, if you are new to Romania Without Orphans, we are uh, a national movement that unites uh, NGOs, churches, companies, public and private persons, all with the single purpose of that every child should benefit from the love and support and safety of belonging to a family. And uh, to that end, we promote adoption, um, we encourage uh, good legislation to help in that process, and we <clears throat> also help to provide the training to those who care for children. And this webinar being just one of those things. Uh, we're also supported by, by generous people and we appreciate the, any, um, any support or uh, financial uh, backing that anyone is uh, willing and able to to give in this direction to support uh, children ending and ending up in families. So uh, tonight we have the privilege and uh, honor of again welcoming Dr. Andy Thacker to um, to the webinar. And uh, oh, I there we go. I need to switch pages here on my end. Uh, Andy, welcome. Um, yeah, you're in Texas, right? I am. Yes. And uh, just to share a little bit from what I, I know, you are a professor in the Biblical Counseling Department at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, mm -hmm. uh, but you're also a graduate, correct? I am. Mm -hmm. And you're passionate about teaching the students, counseling students, to integrate scripture and psychology into real life, into the real world. Is that right? That's right. That's yeah. correct. That's yeah. awesome. That's, I mean, I think that's such a great way to bring... Um, uh, both faith and science together and uh, actually mm -hmm. people, I, I think one of the ways I like to think about science is that it belongs to God we're just discovering it now so um, I love that among your other responsibilities you also have a, a small private practice where you focus on children and adolescents I'm sure that's interesting mm -hmm. and uh, helping LPN LPC interns um, you also have you have your master's degree from Dallas and your PhD from University of North Texas um, probably one of the most important things is that you, well, the most important thing is that you're, you're married to Chad and you have three children and you have adoption that is very close and near and dear to your family. So it maybe is. you mentioned it last time, but for people who didn't yeah. hear it, could you just touch on that by way of introduction? Absolutely. Um, well, my husband was adopted at birth and his younger sister was adopted at birth and then his parents gave birth to their youngest sibling. And so he's, we've always had a heart for adoption because that's been his experience and my experience by proxy with him. And so we, um, in 2016, adopted our third child, Webb. So our first two children um, biologically came through us and then we adopted our sweet little Webb. So he's three and a half and teaches me so much every day. <laughs> and probably has, no, this probably has no connection with regulating emotions, right? No, not, not a problem at all. No. Nope. <laughs> He does it just naturally. It works out great. <laughs> well, you also shared at the beginning that, you know, this is one of your favorite topics, regulating emotions. And I think that's really good. I'm interested to hear why it's your favorite and, and how you unpack it, because emotions are something we all have. And uh, sometimes we need a little more help than others in channeling them in a healthy way. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Send it over to you and let you take it. If people have questions along the way, please write them. If you're on following us on Zoom, uh, write the questions in the chat. Um, if you're following us on Facebook, um, write them in the comments section there, and we will try to get to as many as we can at the end. All right. Sounds good. Well, I am so glad to be back with you guys, and I hope everyone is well and healthy in light of all of our current circumstances. So I love talking about regulating emotions because I feel like emotions have kind of gotten a bad rap in our world. And it could be in um, the scientific world. It could be in a faith-based realm. Sometimes emotions are just, they're things that we are really scared of. And again, they get a bad rap. So from a neurobiological perspective, emotions are part of what drives us to action. So <clears throat> deep, deep down in the innermost layers of the brain, when we sense subconsciously, so when we're not consciously aware of it, when we sense that there's a shift in the environment or there's a shift in our circumstances, we will have um, an awareness of that at a deep level. It's not quite to the conscious level yet, but we'll have a deep awareness of that. <clears throat> and 
at times we really need to act on those, those cues really quickly because those cues are things that are going to keep us safe in environments. Um, so that movement is what drives us to act. And that movement at the very deepest part of us, that's emotions. Mm. And then what bubbles up to the surface. And then when we have an awareness of it, that's what we could call feelings. If you want to make the delineation, some people, some researchers that you'll read, they don't make a delineation between emotions and feelings, but I'm, I'm going to that what's happening, that rumbling deep within us, those are emotions that drive us to action or inaction. And then what comes to the surface when we become aware of it at the, the cortical level, at the outermost layer of our brain, that those are our feelings. And those are those categories like glad, sad, angry, scared. Okay. So emotions just are, they, they're not good. They're not bad. They just, they just are. Where we do get into trouble is what we do with those emotions and how we act upon them. And so sometimes I think I've been taught along the way at times from different professionals and at times from my own family of origin upbringing that if I feel or I I exhibit a certain emotion, then I am being disobedient or I'm wrong. And so that tends to shape us and how we see feelings and emotions. And we tend to categorize emotions as being good or bad. So first things first, emotions just are. There's no good, there's no bad, they just are. And if we don't have emotions, we're we're like sitting ducks. We're in grave danger of something happening to us and then us not being able to discern the danger and then act responsibly. So when, <clears throat> um, well, Uh, This organization is a great example. You see the need and the importance of every child having a forever home. And that stirs your emotions. And it should because it's stirring. And then it drives you to action and whatever that action is. If you open your home to a child, if you give financially, if you serve in whatever way, that is that response. And you want things like that to drive you to an to drive you to action. And so you want your emotions to be stirred because if you didn't, you wouldn't do anything. So they're, they're protective things within us that are really, really important. Okay. Now, again, it's the action that comes after that sometimes gets us in trouble. So if you were with us the first time, we talked a lot about the brain and about what happens in the early stages of development. I'm going to revisit that because a lot of that overlaps with, with regulating emotions. So at birth, <clears throat> babies are born with about 100 billion brain cells and they begin to make connections. And what that means is brain cells or groups of brain cells begin to talk to each other. And that starts happening in about the third trimester of gestation. So when that little one is still tucked away and hidden in, in uh, mom's womb, that brain is going to start gathering up those experiences. And every time an individual has an experience, then their brain cells talk to each other. And <clears throat> what happens over time is brain cells follow what's called Hebb's axiom. And Hebb's axiom says that brain, brain cells or neurons that fire together or talk to each other are statistically more likely to wire together. So what that means is if you have the same experience over and over, your brain cells are being activated to talk to each other or to fire in the same pattern. And the more you do that, the more likely they are to fire in that same pattern over and over. So when you read, it says it takes 21 days to make a habit. That's exactly what they're talking about from a scientific neurobiological perspective is if you do the same thing over and over and over in a repeated action, you're going to increase the statistical likelihood that you will do it again because those brain cells, every time you do the same thing, they just run on that same pathway that was first created. So it's kind of like if you drive a a car down a really muddy um, dirt road after it's rained, your car tires are going to make ruts in that dirt road. If you were to, to drive down that same road the same exact way for the next 100 days, you're going to have huge ruts. You probably don't have to do it for hundred days. It could be five on a dirt road, but it's going to make those ruts and it's going to be more likely that you're going to, your car is just going to want to go back into those tire ruts because it's easier to drive there. That's how actions are in the brain. Okay. So <clears throat> as this baby comes into the world and every time they have an experience, their brain cells are firing and they're making ruts within the brain. There's also specific types of of brain cells, and they're called mirror neurons. 
and mirror neurons. And this was discovered kind of accidentally by some researchers. They were studying the brain, but they weren't studying this. And it was discovered on a lunch break. But what, what's been found is that mirror neurons serve the purpose of <clears throat> helping you gain information and action from behavior that you observe or you witness. So every time you witness an intentional action, the neurons in your brain responsible for that same action fire or talk to other neurons. So they make a pathway. So that's what's so amazing is with mirror neurons, you don't even have to actually do the action for your brain to create some, some um, ruts. So this is really great when we talk about emotional regulation from a healthy perspective. It's really scary when we talk about things like domestic violence and domestic abuse. There's been lots of research that talks about how dangerous it is, even if a child is never physically touched or harmed, them just witnessing their parents or two adults hurt each other physically or emotionally is causing their mirror neurons to fire. And so it's really good in the healthy side. It's really dangerous in the unhealthy side. So you have these mirror neurons. <clears throat> now, the brain is premature at birth. It's, it's premature for a long time. Humans are the longest forming mammal. So the outermost layer of the brain, the cortex, is not going to finish forming until about 25 to 30. So we're premature for a long time. What that means is that <clears throat> if the brain hasn't had the opportunity to do something over and over and to be exposed to something over and over, it's not going to be very good at it for a while. So one thing that infants are not very good at is regulating their emotions. So <clears throat> as a baby comes into the world, they can do one thing initially to signal that they have needs. They cry. And hopefully, think back to last time with the attachment cycle, hopefully when the, the need is experienced in the baby and communicated to the caregiver, the caregiver meets that need appropriately and it, it releases the feel-good chemicals in the baby's brain. <clears throat> if that doesn't happen and the need is thwarted, then it releases the not feel good chemicals in the brain. So emotional regulation early on is a need. And, and actually that need continues throughout the lifespan. And we'll talk about that in a second as adults. <clears throat> but this is probably gonna be very, um, this will probably hit home for many of us because we have probably all needed some other regulation during this season with COVID-19 because we've all been pushed to our limits a lot. <clears throat> so this little baby brain, let's go back to that. It's premature. And when it has, when the baby is sad, when the baby is lonely, when the baby is scared, <clears throat> they don't have the emotional regulation skills yet to regulate that. So when the caregiver responds appropriately, the majority of the time to whatever the need is, especially when it's an emotional need. So if the baby is um, missing mom or the baby's hungry even, <clears throat> or the baby gets scared, maybe the baby is startled, someone makes a loud noise. When the parent or the caregiver calms and comforts that baby, and you know the way you calm and comfort an infant is you draw them close and you hold them close and you say, shh, it's okay, I'm here, it's okay. And you just hold them and, and you may continue to talk to them and say, it's okay, I know you're scared, or it's okay, mom is here. All of that is one, soothing their regulatory system. It's soothing everything within them. Also that touch component and even the um, hearing the heartbeat. The heartbeat is, there's something that's calming and soothing about a regulated sound. So heartbeats are regulated, or they should be regulated. <laughs> You've got other problems if your heartbeat's not regulating well. Um, but just to hear that rhythmic thump is calming and soothing. And so in that moment, you're calming the baby you're helping them regulate emotionally. You're being their regulatory system. But also what's happening is their mirror neurons are witnessing all of that and they're firing and they're beginning to create ruts in the brain that help them understand, oh, okay, when I'm upset, when I'm scared, this is, this is what I tell myself. It's okay. I'm okay. And even <clears throat> at times when, when we see attachment go really well, people children, adults, adolescents, we're probably not consciously aware of that or aware of this fact, but 
we will image someone who's regulating to us in our minds, or we will hear their voice in a way, or the words, the verbiage that they used is something that becomes so ingrained in us that it's something we repeat back to ourselves. And so <clears throat> building the building blocks for self-regulation start in infancy. And it starts with those repeated patterns where the caregiver is mindfully attuned to the child's needs and then appropriately responds with an appropriate response. Okay. So if you have a child that grows up in the home that they're born into and is relatively stable, that tends to happen pretty naturally. If you have a child that doesn't is not in a stable home environment and that um, parenting situation is dissolved, then they may not have those building blocks. And so they're going to go into another environment. And this is very common with children who might go into an orphanage or a foster care system. Um, they, they don't have those building blocks there. They don't have the foundation for emotional regulation. And so if you're going to work and work with those children, parent those children, support them in any way, it's really helpful to see that they're still very much premature in their brain development and they missed out on those building blocks. And so emotionally, they will present younger in their emotional regulation than they actually are chronologically, okay? So if a kid does grow up in the ideal environment where an ideal, when I say ideal parenting environment, I'm saying parents are good enough most of the time. So we're just shooting for mediocrity or average. If that happens, <clears throat> sometimes, parents will get to a place where they have an expectation that that child should be able to regulate themselves on their own. Now, in, in American culture, and I can't speak for Romanian culture, so you guys will fill in these gaps for me as you think about your culture, but I know in our culture, specifically for men, it's not okay for men or little boys to present certain emotions, so specifically sadness. And if a little boy, I would say this probably tends to happen about two or three, where if a little boy falls down and gets hurt, there is a less likelihood that the parents will soothe and comfort like they might have soothed and comforted, and comforted an infant, especially if it's a boy. And they'll say, oh, you're fine. Big boys don't cry. Big boys aren't sad or whatever. Um, culturally in the United States, anger is not as accepted for women. So for little girls, anger is going to be handled differently when that's presented. But the thing is, even though a kid might be two or three or four or 16 or 17, and they've had a good attachment experience, if they are dysregulated in the moment, they still need a more mature brain to come in and help them regulate. And so it actually has the opposite effect of people of what people think will happen, because there's this, this tendency to think, <clears throat> if I soothe and comfort that I'm coddling and I'm gonna create a child that's weak and can't stand on their own, Actually, it does the opposite. It creates this emotional intelligence that is absolutely crucial for success in life. And so if a kid is dysregulated and they're crying, if they're, to the, if they're to the point of crying or they're shutting down in any way, they need the, the parents, the adults, the main caregiver to step in and to help them process and to work through that. And when I say process, I mean, you step in and you start helping regulate. I see you're really, you're really hurting right now. Um, I'm going to sit with you right now, or I will be with you until you can bring yourself under control. So with my, um, so I'm thinking back over the last couple of months as we've all been sheltering in place. Um, so I have a, a nine and a seven and a three and a half year old. Well, I guess they're all in the half year, but my nine year old, she, um, she had a bad dream a couple of nights ago. And when she, when she came to our bed in the middle of the night and I'm not good at 2am, I mean, who is my natural inclination is to be like, why are you up? And why are you standing over me? Like a hawk? You're scaring me to death. But she was, ex she was upset. And so in that moment, I had to fight everything that I wanted to do and to wrap her in my arms and to say, Oh, baby girl, I know you're really scared, but you're okay. And we're safe. Um, let me walk you back up to bed and let me get you tucked back into bed. Let's take a couple of deep breaths. You're going to be okay. I know that really scared you. Um, my middle one, 
he, this was right before quarantine, he got his feelings hurt at a play date with some friends. And he's my go inside, don't talk about it. I can tell that something's wrong, but he's not the vocalizer. And so I said, Will, what's going on, buddy? And he was really sad about how his friends had treated his little brother, actually. And he just burst into tears. And so in that moment, there's sometimes a thought, especially with a seven and a half year old boy to be like, it's fine. I don't know why you're so upset about that. Stop crying. In that moment, he needed me to say, ah, buddy, that really hurts when people are mean to the people we love. And so to help that regulation, the thing that you're looking to do um, as a kid gets older and they're more verbal, because with little bitty kids, you're just going to scoop them up. You're going to hold them close and say, I know I'm here. I know that's hard. As they get older and as we work with adults too, and we interact with adults, we're going to say things, we're going to look for what feeling we see that they're having and we're gonna reflect that back to them. I see you're really feeling scared. Or I, I see that you're really anxious about this test you have to take next week. It's really scary to take tests sometimes. And so what we're doing is we're not trying to fix the problem. We're just trying to be present in the moment. And the intention behind that, one, is so they feel heard. We want them to know I'm here, I see you, I care. We also wanna make those neurons fire because if I do that enough, I'm creating these ruts in my kids' brains so that when I'm not present, they can do that on their own. Okay. So it's, oh yeah, go for it. Go back to something you said earlier, because it just feels like a really clear line between mm -hmm. about emotions to feelings. So mm -hmm. you name them. I mean, if a child, I mean, as adults, we might not always understand our own emotions, but how much more a child and like naming, being able to name an emotion is like being able to name an invisible enemy, like an invisible. Oh, that's so well said. So it sounds like you just described what you were sharing earlier about, you know, the movement from emotions to feelings. And I really like that. That, that really makes a lot of sense. Well, and I love how you just described it, Nathan, of you are um, the invisible enemy. Like you're, you're bringing so much awareness to this moment for the kid or the adult. So this happens with us as adults too. And I'm sure it's happened lots for you in the last couple months for, it's happened for all of us. I've never felt so raw and so numb all at the same time in any season of my life. And there are moments where I can't regulate in that moment. And it looks different as for an adult. Um, you know, it's not, I'm throwing a tantrum and I'm stomping my feet or I'm falling apart crying. Well, there's been some of those moments, but it looks different. And in that moment, I've been able to reach out to my husband and be like, I'm drowning right now. And he's been able to say, okay, let's just take a moment. Or even just him putting his hand on my shoulder, putting his hand on my back and saying, yeah, this is really hard. We're in a hard season. Again, it didn't fix my problem, but it communicated you are not alone in this. Mm -hmm. And it helped, it helped do the next thing we're going to talk about. So with, um, with emotions and with life, we all have what's called a window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. So your window of tolerance is characterized by how much stimulation you can handle, how, how much emotional stimulation you can handle at one time. Um, we could even lump in like sensory stuff into this. So everybody is on a different spectrum or on a spectrum when we talk about your senses. So some people are really sensitive to certain, um, stimuli like touch stimuli. I'm very sensitive to certain like I hate sand and I hate clay I just can't it's way too much for me um so we're all kind of on that spectrum somewhere okay so our window of tolerance when we're little and we're first born it's very small it's tiny and you can think about a little one um and a temperament plays a role in this and personality as well but you can think about a baby they um especially newborn babies I remember with our first child because you don't really know what you're doing or I didn't I didn't know what I was doing when I had kids um like probably the second day we were in the hospital we had a million visitors and I didn't know that that I didn't know that a baby that is touched or held too much when they're little or has too much stimulation becomes fussy and until the end of the day and then we knew because the nurse was like, oh gosh, you overstimulated this child. So the window of tolerance is small when you're born and we want it to grow steadily over time as we get older. But we always keep our window of tolerance. We always have a window of tolerance. And we are probably all 
one phone call away from being knocked out of our window of tolerance. There is always some cataclysmic event that can just totally send you over the edge. Okay. Um, But we're especially at risk for being knocked out of our window of tolerance if a couple of things are present. So I love the, the HALT acronym. If you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, you are less able to regulate your emotions and to stay within your window of tolerance. Okay. So, and that applies to kids and adolescents too. There's a lot of times that um, we as adults forget that our window of tolerance is much bigger or probably is bigger than the kids that we care for. And we go into situations and we expect them to be able to do things when we've knocked them out of their window of tolerance. Um, I, so like, this is something that I struggle with is I forget, I forget that my kids need to eat lunch because I don't eat lunch usually. Um, And so sometimes we get to like one o'clock in the afternoon. I'm like, why are you guys losing your minds? I'm like, oh yes, you guys have not eaten anything. You should be fed. Um, So that's your window of tolerance. So the way it gets bigger and the way it grows, when we are dysregulated and we're knocked out of our window of tolerance, when you have another more mature brain come in and soothe you, it helps grow your window of tolerance. So when you're dysregulated and you have appropriate soothing, whatever that looks like, the for an infant, it's okay. For um, for a kid, for like a elementary school or even adolescent kid that's overwhelmed by their environment. Maybe there's just a lot of stimulation and it's too much. Just like gently taking them into a different environment, taking them into a different room and sitting with them, helping them breathe that you're bringing them back in their window of tolerance, but you're also expanding their window of tolerance. The other way that we build the window of tolerance is through play. So play is astronomically important to children's development, children, adolescent development. And even though this has been a crazy, weird season, one of the things that's been really nice to hear from some people is that their kids have played more in ways that they've never played during quarantine because they've either been too bored with with online stuff or or media, or they haven't been in as many um, adult-led activities. So that child-directed play is really important for all kinds of things. But if you think about with with a baby, an infant, one of the first games that you play with an infant is peekaboo. Um, you, you know, you do the whole thing where you, um, where's baby, boo, and they, you know, laugh and giggle and do whatever. So what's gonna happen during that game is that there will be times where you will get that baby out of their window of tolerance. Maybe you will scare them too much and they like startle, or they startle and cry. So a well-attuned caregiver is gonna be like, oh, sorry, sweet one, and you bring them back into their window of tolerance. Sometimes the baby will get bored and they will be understimulated. And so they're on the bottom part of their window of tolerance and you do something to bring them back into the, the interaction and the engagement. Again, you're broadening that window of tolerance when you play those games. That continues as they get into um, childhood and adolescence when they engage in different types of play with other adults and with peers. So um, with elementary age kids, when they're playing on the swings and they're having to share swings because there's 10 kids and four swings and they're having to negotiate of like, well, I just went, no, it's my turn. As they, as they are able to regulate themselves and bring themselves under control or either have an older kid or a teacher model that for them or a parent, that's broadening their window of tolerance. When you look at older kids that maybe are engaged in more organized sport activities or um, board games, stuff like that, um, technology kind of changes the landscape for us neurologically. But any type of any type of experience like that that's play based for children and adolescents, it's broadening their window of tolerance when they have to um, cope with the ref made a call that they disagree with or they um, struck out, they maybe had a good first half of the game and then they struck out in the second half. That's, that's building their window of tolerance. So we do it when we help them regulate and they're, they're dysregulated and we soothe them and we, we help that occur when they're in play, okay? So play is always, always crucial and kids need a lot of child-directed 
play where they're not being organized or directed by adults to really develop optimally. Okay. So how do we create, how do we help create this for kids, adults, and adolescents who maybe didn't have a great start early on? So one thing that's really important to, to reflect upon is it's hard to give away that which we don't possess. So it's really hard for me to be, to help regulate my kid's brain when I'm not very good at regulating my own brain. And some people grow up in great environments where they're taught very well how to regulate their emotions. Other people have really tough, unhealthy environments. A lot of people are prob probably somewhere in between. And of I'm good at some parts of regulation and I'm not good at others. And so some of it is kind of reflecting upon what emotions do I allow myself to experience or what emotions were okay in my family of origin or my broader cultural viewpoint, what's okay to feel, what's okay not to feel and what's okay to exhibit, what's not okay to exhibit. And then to reflect on how do I handle that in myself? Because if it's not okay for me as the adult to feel angry, I'm going to, I'm going to squelch when one of my kids is showing anger. I'm, I'm going to stop that in its tracks because I'm not comfortable with it. So we always want to start with ourselves examining how, how equipped am I in this moment? Now, if you discover that you, this is an area of growth for you, that's okay. That's, we all come into parenting and caregiving as broken vessels. And so you start to begin to work on your own emotions in the sense that when you, when you feel an emotion, you allow yourself to have it and you, you experience it from a place of non-judgment. So rather than maybe having those subconscious internal messages that occur of, I should not be angry. Why am I angry? This is not that big of a deal. Or, um, we don't always do self-talk. Sometimes we just distract ourselves like, okay, I'll just go eat a cupcake or I'll go buy something online. Bring yourself to that awareness and allow yourself to sit in that moment and to say, I feel really angry right now, or I'm really angry, or you may not know what you feel. Andy? And maybe you just, oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Is it, I, I'm, I'm sure that it must be possible. Is it possible to have conflicting emotions at the same time? I mean, not only just one strong one that you can, but to have like several that are piling up. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's hard to experience um, because it's a conflicting emotion that's pretty common to hear, especially when we work in grief experiences is where someone's lost a loved one who's been terminally ill for a season. And they'll say, yeah. I'm so sad, but I'm relieved that they're not suffering. And I'm relieved because I was the caregiver and I'm exhausted. Then that's guilty. really conflicting. <laughs> yes. Then they have. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Perfect example. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a great question. And so some of it is just allowing yourself to feel whatever is there, whatever comes up. And from an adult perspective, we can ask for resources of support so we can seek other people out and say, I'm having a hard day. I just need you to, I, I need, I need you to say this, um, or I don't need you to fix my problem. This is something that, um, I see a lot in marriages when I work with marriages and I see a lot in my own marriage that there are times that he has to give me explicit instructions about what he needs, or I have to do the same of, I don't need you to solve my problem. I, I can solve this. I'm, I got this. I just need you to be with me in this moment. Um, and Brene Brown has a great little clip on empathy versus sympathy. And empathy is being able to sit in the dark without having to turn the lights on. Sympathy is where when we're trying to help someone feel, we're trying to help someone feel better. Like we're trying to say, ah, oh, man, please don't feel that because it makes me uncomfortable. So we'll start sentences with things like, ah, at least, you know, at least you got the time with your loved one that you had before they died. That's not empathic. <laughs> That's sympathy. So you can reach out for, dis for support. You can also practice what I would call reparenting techniques. So there's times where we see where our own parents fell short because they were broken individuals who had their own flaws. That in a moment where I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm feeling guilty or angry or whatever, that I need to do what I would do for my kid in that moment for myself. And so um, a very soothing um, experience 
that some people report, I find it very soothing, is just to place your hand on your heart and apply a little bit of pressure. And sometimes it's, you want to do double handed. In that moment, just say, it's been a really hard day. It's okay to feel completely depleted or it's okay to feel completely inadequate or whatever, whatever it is. So you're just, you're, you're parenting yourself and you're not showing judgment to yourself for whatever that feeling is. Um, you're acknowledging it from a place of non-judgment. And a lot of times when, when you allow that, that's basically the crux of mindfulness. When you allow yourself to feel and you do it in a way that's non-judgmental, and then you can, you can apply some compassionate response to yourself, the feeling tends to dissipate fairly quickly or it's not as difficult to feel for the whole time. So it's kind of like waves. I think we might've talked about that a little bit last time, that emotions are like waves. They will crest and they will fall. Or um, I'm from Texas, so this is meaningful for me. Um, some of the most strong emotions, the strongest part of them only last about eight seconds. So in Texas, we have bull riding. So if you can survive eight seconds on a bull, you're doing pretty well. So there's a little song I sing in my head by George Strait called Amarillo by Morning because it has, I think it says, I'll be gunning for eight when I, when they pull that gate. And so I'm thinking like, I just got to make it eight seconds. <laughs> so that's my trick. But so with, with yourself, you start with regulating and you start by noticing these emotions in a non-judgmental way. And then you apply compassion to it. Then what's amazing is if you create those neurons within yourself, it's easier to apply that to your kids. So that, or your, whatever children are under your care. Also with other adults, it's easier to do because you become more accustomed at res to, res to responding in that way. So with children, again, think about what their developmental age is, not their chronological age. And generally with children that have trauma or have less than ideal environments, and especially if they've ended up in a new environment because of the trauma that occurred in their first family, um, they will vacillate between different ages. So at times they may look like their chronological age and then they get dysregulated or something triggers them and they revert back to a younger age. So think about what age they're actually presenting at or exhibiting when you go to soothe them. So I think I shared last time that it dawned on my child's therapist and my husband and me that my, um, my littlest one, he's three and a half, but there were lots of moments when he was dysregulated that he looked like a 12 to 18 month old. Um, he, he lost his speech in some ways. He, um, he just would dysregulate and look like an 18 month old. And in that moment, <clears throat> we thought, let's just try feeding him with a baby bottle at times, like at times when he's not dysregulated, let's tr provide that soothing comfort. And then when he is dysregulated, but he needs um, something to drink, let's feed him with a baby bottle and let's hold him close. And it was amazing what it's done in conjunction with other therapies, of course. But we tend to not want to revert back to previous developmental tools because it feels like we are babying a child or an adolescent. And really in that moment, they need us to meet them right where they're at. So when you oh, say when we don't want to revert back, you're saying that's a tendency we have to not want to revert back but it's okay to revert back to meet that need. Absolutely, yes. So we we don't think it's appropriate or healthy to treat them like like a younger age. Um, sometimes we'll call it you're infantilizing that person. You're 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 treating them like a baby, and in that moment they may be reverting back to very childlike, baby like roles and emotional regulation abilities. And so we need to meet them where they're at. And obviously with an adult, they're not going to drink out of a baby bottle, but with an older kid, it may be something they really need is an example, or maybe they need to sit in your lap. And that's something that once a kid gets to a certain age, you're like, you're not going to sit in my lap. Um, but it may be really important for that 10, 12, 13 year old to be held close. Um, I know with my nine and a half year old, she doesn't sit in my lap as much anymore because she's, she's gotten so big that, I mean, she's almost my size. So sometimes it hurts for her to sit in my lap, but there are times where she needs me to hold her on, on my lap, to wrap my arms around her and just to be near her. Um, so go back to that developmental age. Also, there's a great saying by, um, one of my mentors at UNT, his name is Dr. Gary Landreth. And he says, 
When a child is drowning, that is the time to rescue. That's not the time to teach. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think when a kid is dysregulated and they're having a hard time, this is a great teachable moment. Mm -hmm. Um, So when we do a lot of swimming in our family, and if my kid gets in the pool this afternoon and they're drowning, that is not the moment that I'm going to be like, no, 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 no. Like you breathe, like hold your breath underwater, make sure you're making your pizzas and kick your legs. Like in that moment, if they're going under, I'm in the water and I'm yanking them out. I'm going to rescue them. We need to have that same mentality when we're talking about emotional regulation and stability. So if my kid is drowning and maybe they're drowning because they, it's their fault. So like with, um, my littlest one, he knows that he can't get in the pool without his puddle jumper on or without me or my husband with him. If he jumps in the pool and I told him not to, and he doesn't have a puddle jumper on, I'm not going to stand back and be like, Hey, see, I told you, you have to wear your puddle jumper. Or, um, if I don't know if I'm (laughs) working with teaching my older kids social skills and maybe they did something that was socially inappropriate, like picked their nose in class and they come home and they're really sad about it, getting made fun of. That's not the moment that I'm going to be like, I told you not to pick your nose in front of your friends. They were going to make fun of you. In that moment, I need to rescue them. I need to say, oh, I'm so sorry. I bet that totally changed the way your day went. Or I bet you felt so, so sad or so embarrassed or whatever. So teaching comes later. Also from a neurological perspective, if a person is dysregulated, they cannot actually receive any teaching and implement it. Like they, they actually can't even hear what you're saying most of the time, or they're hearing bits and pieces of it. It's kind of like if you've, um, if you've ever been in crisis or if you've, um, like been in a car wreck or had to, you've gotten bad news, you probably hear like every three or four words. You don't hear the whole thing. And and sometimes I know at times when I've had stuff like that happen, I'm like, hold on, wait, tell me again because it doesn't sink in. That's the same with a kid. When they're emotionally dysregulated for whatever reason, you teaching them anything in that moment is pointless because they can't take it on. So then maybe later, if it's a teachable moment, so let's say a teachable moment might be, you have a little one who um, desperately wants to connect with friends, but they, for whatever reason, are not treated very kindly at school. And in that moment, when they make a bid for connection and they try to play with the kids on the playground, and then one of the other kids is like, no, you're stupid. I don't want to play with you. In that moment, maybe that kid lashes out and punches the kid. Well, now they're definitely probably going to be in trouble because they punch the other person. So as the teacher, as the caregiver, as the parent, in that moment, you, you obviously communicate the limit. People are not for hurting and there's consequences. Um, I see you're dysregulated. Let's, or I see you're having a hard time. Let's sit over here together until you can bring yourself under control. Then later when they are under control and you've had some time for things to pass a little bit, then you can kind of go back to it and be like, Hey buddy. Um, so kind of tell me more what happened when you got in trouble on the playground today. And the kid might say, well, I really wanted to play with, with Zach. And he told me I was stupid. And so then I punched him. And so then you can say, well, I wonder what that felt like when he said you punt, you said you're stupid. You can emote and, tell, and then say, well, I wonder, I wonder if punching him made him want to play with you more or less in that moment. And the kids probably be like, probably they don't want to play with me because I hit him. You'd say, okay, I get you want to be in a relationship. One of the things you can do is you can either ask again or you could try to talk to somebody else. So you save the teachable moment for when they can actually hear it and you can get more mileage from it. And I just want to uh, remind people that we were sailing toward the end quickly. It was very interesting. And if but if anyone has any questions, um, please uh, please go ahead and write them in either either of the chats. Okay. Well, and this is a great time to transition to questions. So if there are any, or Nathan, if you have any. Wow. That's a lot to chew on. I, I really, I think, I really, I really love the way, um, you know, so many times we, we, we or think about a training and we think, and, and we see that too when we're t- teaching the trauma competent caregiver training, people will just give me the five things I need to do. Mm-hmm. And it's not like that. It's not like mm-hmm. that. Or like, you know, it's not 
uh, three quick steps. It's creating an environment, and the environment yeah. has its roots in me as a parent. You know, it's like I have to do the work in here before it can mm-hmm. happen out there. So mm-hmm. I suppose you know, if I'm just I'm processing this, you know, a little bit myself here. Um, one of the takeaways is if there's dysregulation in, in my household and I'm having trouble helping my child, that that's a cue for me. Um, mm-hmm. And then if if I've attended to that work and I'm still having uh, challenges, um, I suppose there could be um, it could be a place for learning. You know, mm-hmm. I need to learn some. That might be a place for techniques or like, okay, what am I missing? Getting another outside perspective. Um, I know with you know with uh, adopted uh, uh, children who not not necessarily just adopted, but children who have passed through trauma and uh, and loss, which every uh, every adopted child has has suffered loss. Um, that brings extra challenges, uh, like mm-hmm. you're describing. Um, can you say a little bit more about the sensory thing? Because uh, I, I know that's a lot to you know. That's a big field, but Mm -hmm. could you say a little bit more? Because I'm sure there are a lot of adoptive parents who are like, you don't understand. (laughs) These things come out of nowhere. Um, A parent that I know Mm -hmm. of um, recently shared an instance with me where she served um, a certain kind of cabbage roll. It wasn't, in fact, it wasn't Mm -hmm. a cabbage roll. It was, it was, it was wrapped in a grape leaf. And that's what, that's what the foster parent had made. And the child hadn't eaten that since he had been at the foster parent, when he saw that, Mm -hmm. he went ballistic. He went, he got regulated. So can you describe, can you help us understand what's happening there and how do we handle that? Yeah, well, and sensory integration is a huge area. So, um, and I can only speak kind of to my little area because I know, like my little one sees an occupational therapist and she's incredibly helpful for him because he has a lot of sensory stuff that's going on. But even like the grape leaf, that different experiences. Um, it could be smell related. It could be texture related. It could be, um, visually any type of a, of a sensory type experience, which all experiences are, but they all have equal weight and how they can trigger memories. So Mm -hmm. it could have been just the visual of that grape leaf. It could have been the smell because maybe it was a different smell. And, And what happens is those, those sensory aspects of our mental, memories are so ingrained in our brains, oftentimes we may not have a conscious awareness of what it what it's triggering, but our body never ever forgets. Mm-hmm. Our body always keeps track of all of that. And so it, it could have been the visualization, it could have been the smell, it could have been, um, which, and I guess if he, I don't know if he even touched it, if he didn't touch it, it was probably the visual and the smell perhaps that just triggered that memory. And if I had to guess, there was something very negative in that that foster home experience. And it will release a flood of memories. And so any part, um, it happens with what we call neural nets. So neural nets are when neurons um, that fire together get gathered up in a net together. And what happens is they get so strong that you only have to have one part of one part of the neural net activated to pull the whole net down. And so sometimes it's a positive net. So it's um, like, like, let's say uh, my kids are my oldest and my youngest are, they have favorite blankets and they sleep with them every night. And I know that that they're BBs. They're both called BB. BBs are wrapped up in a neural net where I've wrapped them up and held them close with BB. My husband's done the same thing. They, they receive a lot of soothing care and comfort. So even if um, I'm not present in the middle of the night or my husband isn't present, they can wrap up with BB. It has a specific smell. It has a specific texture and it's going to pull down that whole neural net and that flood of emotional experience and neurological experience. And it's positive. But if you have a neural net for something negative, like grape leaves, or sometimes it's the smell like a perfume or a cologne or a, a body lotion, um, Those can be so, or even like a body posture sometimes is so stimulating for people that have been abused that you just have to either be in that position, have someone touch you in a certain way, um, see something and it pulls down the whole neural net. And so it sounds like that's what happened for this little guy is his whole neural net got pulled down just with the, with the sight of a grape leaf. So what is mom's role there? 
Yeah. So in that moment, it's, it's not, we want to be thermostats. We don't want to be thermometers. So our role is to be a thermostat. So a thermostat regulates the temperature of the environment. A thermometer responds or is regulated by the temperature in the environment. So we want to kind of set the, the, the stage. So one of the things that I do, <clears throat> especially when I work with clients that are activated and flooded, um, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to lower my voice and I'm going to talk quieter. And so I'm going to try to slow all of me down so that I'm not activating at all. I'm also going to move my body posture that I'm going to get lower than they are if I can. <laughs> so if it's a little kid, I'm going to crouch down. If, if they're at the table and they're sitting, I'm going to get, I'm going to like crouch down below the table so that my body is not aggressive in any way, especially because you, you don't know what you're dealing with in that moment. Um, I'm also going to, <clears throat> to try to get them to, if they will, um, touch my hands in a very safe way. So I might say, Hey, would you, would you put my hand, your hands on top of mine? Or, um, I love Karen Purvis talked a lot about this in her TBRI training of look at my eyes. Hey, can I see your eyes? And I'm always going to be super gentle with my tone. Free, yeah. Free and I, yes. So we're going to rely on that connection. And I might say something like, I see that you're really overwhelmed right now. I want to remind you that you're safe. Um, also, sometimes it's helpful. So we have um, we have like a little tent in our living room and we call it the timeout tent. And it's not necessarily like go to timeout, you're in trouble tent. It's the, oh, I think you might need a moment. And we're like, hey, I think you might need a moment in the timeout tent. And it's, it's contained because sometimes when you're um, flooded by a traumatic, ex uh, traumatic memory, you need to be in more of like a contained area. It has comfy blankets and pillows. And so I'm like, Hey, I might say, Hey, let's go sit in, let's go sit in the safe spot. And I will sit with you until you're ready to come back in. Um, in that moment, you don't want to be harsh or punitive. Now that doesn't mean that boundaries don't exist. You still have to set boundaries. So, um, one of two of mine, in fact, <laughs> have, have been very physically aggressive when they've been in the three, four range three, four and less range when they got angry and they might want to throw something or, um, my littlest one is a biter. And so in that moment, I'm still going to set boundaries. I know you're really scared right now, or I know you're really angry. I'm not for hurting or people aren't for hurting. You may choose to sit in the quiet spot and not hurt me, or you may choose for me to not sit with you. So I'm always going to have to set those boundaries or maybe if the kid's throwing something or, um, you still, you still maintain boundaries, but you are trying to be the thermostat. And so also a harsh tone of voice, not knowing what a kid might've experienced in previous environments, a yell, an elevated tone, a harsh tone can also be stimulating and triggering from an, an auditory perspective. And so one thing that, um, you, you just kind of have to be really careful with that. And so I'm always kind of lowering my voice. I'm talking quieter. Um, I'm going to be as gentle as I possibly can be. That's great. That's great. I appreciate that. Mm. You know, I, I, I just, 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 a, a, just to kind of reinforce what you were sharing about the sensory issues, triggering memories. Uh, this past two, three days ago, I walked past a bush and around the corner from our mm. home on the way to the office. I caught a smell of something. And in, a, in an instant, mm. I was about 40 years ago, at a place where we used to vacation. So it wasn't even a daily thing. It was a rare thing. And it was yeah. just, all of a sudden, bang, I was there. I was like, wow, that was really, really interesting. That's uh, such a perfect example. Yeah. Only, only and that, probably something you haven't thought about. That was a positive thing for me. Yes, it was nowhere near my, my thinking. Uh, absolutely. Because we haven't, been, I've been back there for probably 35 years. I don't know. It's been a long, long time. Um, mm -hmm. But, but yeah, and if that memory happens to be a negative one, then I know I know from from some experience that we can relive some of those old emotions all over again. Yeah. Well, and your memories always follow the same neurological pathway as when it was first created. So every memory is a living, live memory in the sense that those neurons are firing on the same exact pathway. So whatever whatever emotional experiences you had when the pathway was created 
you're going to have those same emotional experiences when you relive that experience again. Yeah. Well, in, in closing here, are there any uh, follow-up resources that you could recommend for people? I know we talked about Karen Burbis's, uh We Have a Connected Child translated in Romanian. Oh, the book, we have that translated. Um, uh, also, from, from in terms of Romania Without Orphans, we have the Trauma Competent Caregiver Training, uh, which... Um, mm -hmm trying to figure out, you know, we're experimenting with doing it online. Um, mm -hmm. But if anyone's interested in that, they can they can contact uh, Romania Without Orphans, in which we, we do talk about some of these issues. But we got into a, a depth of understanding tonight that I, I really appreciate. Do you have other, other ideas, other resources? I really like Dan Siegel's writing. He's written a couple of books. Um, well, he's written a lot of books. But the one specific to this would be <clears throat> The Whole Brain Child or No Drama Discipline. Those are really helpful when you are thinking about how to parent with the brain in mind. And then, of course, Purvis's work is great because Siegel's is geared towards all types of kids. Purvis's is, is geared towards kids that come out of really tough environments. And it is children that come out of tough environments. They just are shaped differently because I've had two that have come out of our environment, which is fairly stable. And then one that even didn't spend any time outside the womb in that environment. And he is marked by it and shaped by it. And the clients that I've worked with year after year, it, it really, it changes a child. And what I've noticed is that the general public and a lot of times friends and family members and support system, they are very well-meaning, but they have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to child rearing and parenting and shepherding a child that's come out of a tough home. And so I've, I've listened to a lot of really well-meaning advice that's been given to people. And it's so, um, it can be dysregulating for the adult that's shepherding a child that comes out of a tough environment because it does not fit at all. So. Yes. Uh, Parents all come from different perspectives, and so we have to kind of filter everything, don't we? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And and you know, there's something. I mean, even for the the personalities of our children, we have to filter. Mm -hmm. The discipline that works for one doesn't necessarily work for the other. So. That's right. But, well, Andy, again, thank you for um, being with us and for again, taking another step in in the direction here, and uh, giving us a lot to think about. Um, and absolutely. I absolutely. What I love about about this is as a result of trying to find resolution uh, solutions for our, our children, we're going to grow. The parents are going to grow. So, That's so well said. The win-win. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll be sending out an email uh, to everyone who registered uh, via the Zoom link um, with some follow-up information. And But anyone is welcome to view our website at RomaniaWithoutOrphans.ro. And we have some, some of the things are there in English uh, and the rest of it is resource pages in Romanian. But um, please write, ask for uh, help or connection to other, other materials or resources. So thank you, Andy. Right. See you thank next time. Thank you. Okay, see you next time. Y'all have a good one. Thank you. Take care.